thanks everyone so much for for being here. Um, we're excited to be with you all and we're inspired by the work that you all are doing and hope that we can be helpful to you in, as you do this work. Um, maybe before we start, just so we have a sense of our audience and folks experience level, if people wouldn't mind just putting in the chat um, how much organizing experience you have, like how much how much time you've, or for how long you've been doing activism or um, organizing or advocacy work, paid or unpaid, just so we have a sense of um, these concepts. And thanks, Hassan, for chiming in. Um, so yeah, folks who just put that in the chat, um, how much time you've spent organizing before. 40 years. That's amazing. Yeah, plenty of you are going to have more experience than us. So, um, you know, and, and we, we know that everyone has a different uh, array of experience. We just want to try to tailor what we're doing towards that. And for those with 20, 40 years experience, I'm sure a lot of this will be very familiar to you. And I'm sorry if it's boring <laughs> for you, but hopefully it'll at least spark dialogue that you all can continue after this meeting. Fifty years, three years. Chris, participant. Okay. Anyone else want to share how long you've been doing organizing? Okay, we've got at least one person. Emily is is new to it, so six to seven years. Okay. So yeah, I'll you know for those of you with a lot of experience, I'll apologize in advance for some of the stuff that is already going to be familiar and known to you. Um, but again, this is. This is an opportunity for you all to increase the dialogue within BCAN around some of these organizing principles and strategies and, and really share knowledge and resources with each other. You all have so much experience. And so, as I said, we can kick this conversation off tonight. And I think many of you can add to it and go even deeper and, you know, train and mentor one another as you go forward. Um, with that being said, I think I'm going to try to screen share and, and get our visual presentation going and we can introduce ourselves. Once I do this, I probably won't be able to see the chat. And so if someone wants to get my attention, you're gonna have to just kind of chime in and unmute yourself, um, but don't be shy to do that at any point if you need to, to do that. Are folks able to see um our slideshow presentation yep we're good okay it's still loading on my end great well i think we'll we'll dive right in thanks again for hosting us um we're here with run on climate my name's jack hansen i'm the, exec the executive director here and we're going to talk about some tools for advocate advocating at the local level for for policy changes um my background experience, um, I've been doing environmental, climate, and political organizing for um, probably 12 years at this point. Um, and over time, I kind of shifted my focus. I, I, I worked on Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign, so I have some experience doing a national level campaign. But ever since then, I've really focused on the state and local level here in Vermont. And Eventually, I ran for city council myself in 2019 and was elected, um, served three and a half years on the city council. Um, and I co-founded Run on Climate about a year and a half ago with a couple of other organizers here in Burlington. Um, and now, you know, this is really my primary focus, doing this work and supporting folks like yourself, supporting other local elected officials. Um, candidates and, and climate advocates who are doing local level work. Hi guys, I'm Phoebe. I'm the operations director here at Run on Climate and uh, actually Somerville, Mass, born and raised, so right in the neighborhood. Uh, Notice some familiar names and faces and doing some research for uh, this presentation and really excited to be with you guys here today. Uh, I've been in the kind of climate organizing sphere for about five years, did some door-to-door -door canvassing to get my start with a Vermont Public Interest Research Group and um, have been working on some commuter incentive to stop drive 
Thanksgiving and now with Run on Climate. So I'm excited to share more with you guys later. Hello, um, I'm Nicole Town. Um, I'm a business administration major at Champlain College. I'm also an eco rep um, for climate justice on campus. Um, and I work with Run on Climate developing trainings like this one. Great, and just to give, I think some of you are familiar with Run on Climate, what we are, some aren't. So just to give a quick sense of what we are, um, we're gonna play something from our initial launch video that we did when we first started the organization and we ran a GoFundMe campaign to get off the ground. So we're just gonna show you a quick two minute video of that um, and then we'll dive into things. The climate crisis is the most pressing issue of our time. If we don't act dramatically now, we will live through a period of climate chaos that will sink cities, displace millions, and disrupt the ecosystems and infrastructure we rely on to survive. When seeing how far we still have to go to get off of fossil fuels, it's easy to throw your hands up and feel like there's nothing you could do that would make a difference. We felt that way ourselves a few years ago, and then we decided to do something. Over the last three years, we've helped build a movement in our community to revitalize local politics through grassroots campaigning and a bold, progressive vision. Central to this movement has been the need to take dramatic action on the climate crisis. Now, we're at a pivotal moment where federal dollars are flowing to local government at a scale that we haven't seen in decades. This is a huge opportunity. But we need to recognize that the federal government isn't just going to wave a magic wand and switch all of our buildings to renewable heating, or add solar to every rooftop, or add bike lanes to every street. This vital work must be done at the local level. Seeing the tangible change that has happened in our community and local organizing efforts has given us hope. In just the past two years, our coalition elected four first-time candidates, including the youngest woman, first woman of color, and first openly non-binary person to Burlington City Council. Passed the net zero energy roadmap to get Burlington off of fossil fuels by 2030. Made Burlington the second city in the nation to require landlords to weatherize their rental units and passed a ballot item to allow the city to regulate heating systems, to switch buildings from natural gas to renewable heating. We believe so strongly in the power of creating change locally by building relationships and having conversations with neighbors about the moment we're in and how we need to respond. We want to share this model with communities across the country, transforming their communities from the ground up and passing policies that are in line with the stark reality of climate science. Our organization will, one, identify and recruit climate champions to run for local office. Two, support them in their campaigns at little to no cost to them. Three, use these grassroots campaigns to build urgency, awareness, and community-based action around the climate crisis. And four, pass aggressive climate policies that have ripple effects across communities and up to the state and federal level. Your donation. Okay, the rest is, I think, a fundraising pitch, so I'll pause it there. Um, but that is just a quick <laughs> overview of what we are at Run on Climate, what we believe in. Um, and to add to that, hopefully folks can see. Um, yeah, we focus exclusively on the local level and really supporting folks like yourselves doing this local level work. I don't really need to give you all the pitch on why local level makes sense for climate. Um, I think the local level is where we have the most power and influence. Um, and, it, and it fits into the broader climate movement. The reason we started this organization, we feel like there's a lot of climate organizations doing great work at the state and federal level, but there's not enough support for local level action. And there's so much opportunity to make a huge difference um, at the local level and really use that to shift what's possible politically and um, serve as a model for other communities and um, to, to influence the state and federal level as well. Yeah, I see a hand up, uh, Linda. Um, yeah, what is the Overton window? Yeah, I should have, uh, I should have explained that since it's on the side. Yeah, the Overton window is really the, and if anyone else wants to chime in here, please do, but the Overton window is kind of the window of what's considered politically viable or uh, reasonable. So certain, you might say like, oh, the government should ban all cars that run on gasoline. Pretty much everyone would say like, that's not gonna happen. That's not a serious proposal. It's not politically possible. It doesn't really fit within the Overton window. 
Um, but the Overton window sh shifts constantly, right? So that's kind of the example we gave of Berkeley in the video, Berkeley, California, banned natural gas and new construction. At the time, that was pretty radical and seemed like, oh, wow, that's, you know, Berkeley, California, they're crazy over there. They're, they're aggressive. They're doing that just from a main, you know, mainstream audience. But now, you know, dozens and dozens of cities have done that. And you have entire state legislatures looking at that policy that was somewhat unthinkable five or 10 years ago. Um, so when we start to pass more aggressive policies at the local level, it kind of normalizes them more, makes them feel a little bit more acceptable to the point where they can, they can pass out to her. Does that help explain it? And again, if other people want to chime in, you can do it in the chat or um, unmute yourself. That's fine. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah. And, and just in terms of questions, you know, we will, um, we're going to fly through a lot of concepts um, throughout the training. And so we're going to try to move somewhat quickly through it because we have a lot of ground to cover, but then we're going to open things up to Q&A. And so we can dive deeper based on what you all want to hear more about or focus more in on. So obviously, if there's a clarifying question like that, if you don't know what we're saying, please do interrupt because we want to make sure that you are following us. But if you want to dive deeper into something, probably better to wait until the end um, on that. So yeah, quick overview of the training. We're going to go through, we're going to talk about building a policy campaign um, and some campaigning tools and strategies and really just some general organizing tools and strategies that Again, many of you are very familiar with, others it might be new to. But we're going to start um, by talking about a case study to illustrate um, kind of the arc of a campaign and a campaign that we did in Burlington that we are very proud of and you know want to want to share with others, think can can be helpful for others doing this work, especially as you all are doing some somewhat related work. And so this campaign in Burlington was all about rental weatherization. Um, so getting the city to require rental units to meet certain energy efficiency standards and um, to, to require the property owners to have these buildings weatherized. And this was really inspired by Boulder, Colorado. You can see in the image there. Um, they had a universal rental energy efficiency um, mandate from the city um, that they rolled out of the, over the course of eight years that was extremely successful, 97% compliance rate. Um, and so we were able to kind of model our campaign and policy off of that. And we really merged it into my electoral campaign for, for city council in 2019. So when you're thinking about a campaign, you obviously want to have a clear goal and a goal that's easy to define and that, you know, everyone working on it can understand and that the public can understand. So in this case, we had a very defined goal of, um, as I said, getting the city to, to require this, um, getting the city to enforce it and actually, you know, have have real teeth behind it so that it, it that the, you know, it actually had compliance from from landlords. And then ensure that this isn't just driving up costs for, for renters. And as I mentioned, we merged it with my campaign. You obviously want to understand the direct and indirect impacts of what it is that you're advocating for. So these are some of them, not all. You know, We took the time to dive into direct and indirect, and especially try to think about maybe negative impacts. Um, although I didn't list any negatives here, these are some of the positive impacts of um, this rental weatherization concept. Okay. Winnability is also important. I, I've been having a lot of conversations with organizers here in Burlington about that is some campaigns might be laudable, they might be morally, you know, perfect, but are completely unwinnable. And you could spend 10,000 hours and a million dollars trying to do it and, and not get it passed. Um, so just understanding the winnability and you can't know for sure, but you, there are some metrics you can look at to, to try to understand the winnability of your campaign. In this case, it did feel like a very winnable campaign, which is part of why we chose it. 
the enthusiasm level from talking to people in the community about it was very high. So that helps with winability. We also had a lot of natural allies in this campaign. Um, Burlington is mostly renters. So we kind of already had this natural ally that made up a majority of the population. And then anyone who's really concerned about climate is, is probably gonna be a natural ally. Anyone who cares about economic justice because these are high heating bills that folks are paying as a result of you know inefficient rental units. Um, and we have obviously a natural enemy in landlords because this is some this is work they have to do. This is money they have to spend. Um, so knowing what you're up against, knowing the natural allies and enemies, um, the enthusiasm level, these are some of the metrics. And then understanding what what would it actually take to win? What, you know, going back to that clear objective, clear goal. Um, in our case, what we were pursuing is an ordinance change. Um, so it was pretty straightforward. This is what a win looks like. It's the city council adopting an ordinance. Um, and so if you don't know what it takes to actually get that win, it's hard to know the winability. Um, I'm gonna keep talking about sort of context and winability. Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, I don't know if it's too detailed, but how did you win over the landlords or other folks who were getting in the way? Yeah, well, um, we didn't, I would say short answer, we didn't necessarily win over the landlords, um, but we'll we'll walk through the whole campaign and maybe that'll give you a better sense of of how we were able to win. Um, but it wasn't necessarily through getting, getting them on our side. Um, so yeah, understanding the context of your campaign. Um, in this case, the political context of Burlington, we had had a mayoral election the previous year that was highly contested. Um, and housing was really the main issue that dominate that was dominating our politics. Um, really limited housing supply, poor housing quality, um, low vacancy and expensive rental housing in Burlington. Um, it was also winter when we were doing this campaign, which was really important because, you know, if you're trying to get people passionate about this in the summer when it's not affecting them, that's one thing. But if you're going to someone's door and they're paying, they just paid a $300 heating bill and they're, un, they're physically uncomfortable in their home, they're going to care a lot more about what you're saying. Um, so it tied into the context and, and fit well in the context. Also, this was 2019. So Trump administration and Congress were actively rolling back on climate. Our Republican governor was vetoing climate legislation. There wasn't much movement at the state and federal level. And so we were able to tap into the fact that Burlington, Vermont is a place that people want to see climate action and they're not seeing it at the state and federal level. So if we could pitch it at the local level, um, you know, there would be support. And again, this is this is all to illustrate like a lens that you can analyze your own campaigns as you're as you're um, deciding what campaigns to do and then trying to trying to win those campaigns. Research is critical as well. So trying to get ahead of trying to get deeper into the policy and the nuances of it, at least with your internal team um, and trying to ask the questions, the tough questions about this. So these are some of the things that we studied around this policy and we met weekly with a smaller team just to dive into the, the nitty gritty of the actual policy and what it would mean um, and how it could work. And these are questions that you can ask of other policies too. You, you don't wanna, you know, you're trying to get someone to do something, you wanna do the work for them, right? And so you wanna answer the questions that you know they're gonna have or that you know that detractors are gonna have. You wanna be prepared and get ahead of that. Then part of the planning phase two, and I'm not sure what stage you all are in with some of your, with your, with your major campaigns at this point, but the planning's always ongoing too, and it evolves as you're doing the work itself. Understanding the stakeholders and understanding the roadmap to victory, I think are both key. Um, I just lost the visual, but can people still see and hear me? Yeah, we're good. good. We're good, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, th this, you know, we knew that it had to go through the city council. Someone would have to introduce it. It would have to pass, be sent to committee. 
be sent back to city council and be approved by the mayor. So understanding the flow of, okay, these are the concrete steps that we need in order to get the, you know, to, to win this campaign. And then below are just understanding, okay, who are some of the players in this? Vermont Gas, um, the, you know, the gas utility, um, some of these works that, some of these organizations and companies that do energy efficiency work, um, the electric utility, some of these grassroots advocacy groups, whether it's housing or economic justice, et cetera. So knowing and connecting with key stakeholders, whether they're friendly or oppositional, I think is key. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more. I'm sure many of you know about inside game, outside game, but it's really important to have both happening and your B can doesn't necessarily have to do both at once, but I think collectively as a movement, it's important to have folks working the inside and the outside. So inside game, working with um, decision makers directly and building those relationships and trying to work the policy through the system and, 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 you know, make it happen on the inside. Whereas outside game is building popular support, creating pressure from the outside. Um, and, and again, we'll get into this later, but these were some of the ways that we, we played both sides of that. And this was like our public access TV, just as a way to further educate and get the word out. We did a, a special on, on the policy. This is some of the social media we did. Um, another way to get people involved and highlight the problem and try to spark, you know, some outrage around this. So we tried to engage people, have them send in pictures of their of their living conditions, you know, seeing these large cracks and doors and windows. Um, it was good to use for our socials and it was a good way to get people engaged and energized too who were submitting these photos. And then using social media, of course, to try to get people to come out to key meetings and, and be strategic in, in showing up. And obviously, you know, and we were catering a lot towards young people and students. And so an ordinance committee isn't necessarily the funnest, most exciting thing, but you can try to make it seem more exciting um, through some social media and, and marketing and, um, you know, get folks more excited and specifically, you know, give people a sense of specifically what to say. So like, you'll notice this social media, we're not just saying like, show up, we're saying specifically voice your support for a three year timeline, because that was what was politically needed um, at that time to in order to pass the pot or in order to get the victory we wanted, which was the quicker implementation timeline. And so you need your audience to know the context and know the demand um, ahead of time to be effective. And this again goes to inside outside game because, you know, I was on city council at this point, having these negotiations internally that were basically invisible to the public, some of these meetings and stuff where I'm pushing for the shorter timeline. So getting folks to show up at the right time in this meeting and specifically push that from the outside was was key as I um, bargained on the inside. The timeline of, of how this happened. So obviously it's important to have like intermediate goals and milestones and victories along the way. In the case of rental weatherization, it ended up taking a few years. Um, you know, we got the initial study passed in, in May of 2019, got the initial resolution passed in October of that year. COVID created a significant delay, but ultimately the policy did pass back out of committee to council. Um, May of 21, we got the first phase of it approved and full policy in January of 22. So that's a little bit about that campaign. Um, again, we'll have more time if we want to, if folks want to go deeper into it. And now um, we'll talk a little bit more generically about, um, you know, building out your campaign. I think, our, Nicole, are you tapping in at this point or? Yep. Okay, great. The floor is, is yours. So as we move into um, building out your policy campaign, 
Um, it's really important to take some time to take stock of your organization and really think about um, where you lie in the broader climate justice ecosystem in your community. Um, so some questions that are important to ask of yourselves as an organization are like, are we replicating work that's already been done? How can we be of service to the broader movement? Do we have the capacity to do this? Are there any fellow organizers or organizations we need to work with in order to do this work effectively? What role do we have in our community and what is it that we're really good at? And I'll send it back to Jack to go through the steps of building out your policy campaign. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, that's a crucial step and a constant reminder to check in and do that self-assessment. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll dive into some of these principles um, of of building a campaign, the arc of a campaign. So the planning phase, um, you know, choosing an effective campaign. You all already have multiple campaigns in the works, so I'm not going to talk about that, but. I'll talk about these other steps, um, a little bit of, of the planning phase, um, understanding the roles that different individuals are, are playing. And we talked about the importance of you know, clear goals, um, trying to map out visually um, and mentally the, the course and, and what it's gonna take to win. We're gonna talk a bit about power mapping as a tool. Um, of course, it's critical to not just be internal, but to be constantly meeting with other players, again, whether or not they're friendly or not, it's it's key to meet with them and, and um, discuss the issue and have a clear plan of action. So these things are all ongoing. Um, you know, we're kind of sequencing it as planning coming first, but really the planning is, is continuous. The building phase where you're getting the public a lot more involved, raising awareness, um, building support and momentum. Um, you know, getting folks to show up, whether it's to key decision point meetings or whether it's your own events or rallies to, to put pressure and making sure that you're applying pressure to the decision makers um, in a way that's strategic, in a way that they um, feel like they have to, they have to act. And that's, yeah, that segues into, into this. So um you know knowing who the key decision makers are and then giving them a pathway to meet the demand so you're right you want to raise the demand but you want to also show them how they can meet that demand so it's so it's clear how they can kind of relieve that pressure that you're putting on them and give them that out um is key and i can you know i can speak to that from being on the other side of things and being a city councilor getting pressured on numerous issues is if there's not a clear way to meet that demand or pressure, you're not really gonna do anything about it. But if there's clear pressure and a specific demand that it's known that you can do it, um, the pressure feels a lot more intense and there's a way to actually you know, respond to it. And then continuing, as I said, especially these campaigns that take several years, really important to have intermediate victories and milestones to keep folks engaged and, and energized. And then the final step, hopefully not always, but hopefully is winning and, you know, ensuring that you're aware of when you're approaching that moment, that kind of make or break yes or no vote type of situation or moment, communicating that, building towards that, um, making sure that your audience knows the stakes and that this, this truly is it. Um, and then if you do get the win, it's really important how you claim that, how you celebrate that and tell that story and, and learn from it. So you don't wanna just stop when you get the victory. Um, it's really key how you handle that success and, and share it. And then from there, you can, you can reflect and learn um, based on that campaign. And that's obviously win or lose. You wanna take some time afterwards to take stock before you move into a new campaign. Um, this period is critical. Also just recuperating and resting. Um, you know, many of us are doing this on the side of, you know, a lot of folks are doing this on the side of full-time work and busy lives. And so need to take time to rejuvenate. All right, so we're gonna talk about some tools and strategies. 
um, power mapping. So this is random. This isn't what I actually think the landscape is, but I think we can, now's a good time probably to involve you all. So I'm not just talking at you and, and think about, um, you know, with the schools campaign, um, who some of these players are, how much power they have. Um, so this is a quadrant analysis. If you've never seen this before, it's where you put, you map out the different relevant stakeholders and players along how influential they are in specific, you know, specifically to this decision, this campaign. So that's the up and down, um, you know, the Y axis. And then the X axis it, going across the screen is where they stand on the issue. So how supportive they are. Um, so maybe we can take a minute as a group to just think about this. We won't do the full blown thing right now, but you all can obviously do that in future meetings. But let's take a minute to just play with this as a group and think about it. Um, so I'm going to try to I can't see anyone, so I'm going to try to. Um, exit out of full screen, but. Yeah, in terms of the school campaign, where where do folks think some of these players lie and who are the other players and you know where might you place them on this on this map? Well, to start, I'd say that Mayor Wu I would put as actually being probably one of the most influential on this campaign and then would be fairly, I would say strongly a supporter of what we're doing. Not that we interact with her directly as much on this. Okay, so very, very influential to the decision and very supportive. Maybe up here. Do other do other folks agree with that? It's okay to disagree. That's part of this whole exercise is like trying to figure this out, and people are going to have different perspectives. So, well, I'd love to hear others' thoughts. I'd agree with that. Okay, and what about what about some of the other players? I mean, I just threw some of these. I don't know about this campaign like you all do, but I put the superintendent in and the teachers union. Extinction Rebellion Boston, just because that's a climate group. But again, it's, you know, mapping the level of influence and the level of support and trying to get a lay of the land. Um, other this, thoughts? This is Tom. I, I I would think that the parents is too broad a category because there are several parent groups of different mm -hmm. kinds. Yeah. Yeah. What's a subgroup? What's a subgroup of parents that you would say? Uh, I don't know, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are some organized groups of parents. Um, we're working with a group called FAMCOSA, which is Families for COVID Safety. Okay. FAMCOSA? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's another relevant group. Where, and where would you say they land on this? Um, they're, well, they're, they're very much with us about the... Um, ventilation part of it mm -hmm. um so strongly support yeah now um, are they influential um no more than we i would say mm -hmm. so maybe maybe right now they're they're a little lower down and you know part part of this is you can influence you you can affect how influential these groups are like organizing with famcosa both you and them can become more influential obviously but it's again taking stock of where things are today um other people's thoughts on this I had a question. Is this also including stakeholders or is this all? Um, oh, for sure. Yeah, it, it's really anyone. 
anyone relevant to the decision, like whether they're impacted by it or they care about it. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. It's very inclusive. So I'm thinking the some facilities of the schools. Um, they keep coming up, <laughs> so and they're going to be the ones to ultimately manage whatever um, solution does go in. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's kind of the facilities of the school, like the employ, like the employees. Uh, I don't know how they're. I feel like they're a union. Um, they're under a union, but with the Boston school system. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure. I, I would say that they're they're definitely important. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if they have a seat at the table at this time, I guess. Like it'd be great to actually see if they are more influential, but I'm not sure that they are. Um but I would, they do have a stake with the outcomes of this, mm -hmm. um, as well as the school committee. Mm -hmm. um, so. What about the school committee? Do you have a sense of where they stand on this? I, I believe they're the ones informing the city council. I gotta find my notes they're here somewhere. Uh, but I believe that they'd be the ones um, that may drive some of the decisions and inform the yeah. city council. No, I think that's true. I mean, you all know better than me, but I think that's true that they're kind of the decision maker or one of the key mm. decision makers. So I would put them high up for sure. And do you, and I'm, but I'm wondering if you have a sense of you know their level of potential support for this. Uh. I feel like they're less <laughs> supportive. Okay. I think they're out of it. <laughs> they're like, <laughs> um, they're definitely uh, them. They're a group we'd, we'd have to work with because I think they are, yeah. they may be more overwhelmed with what's coming down the road kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. and maybe um, I'm thinking of the Overton window. There might be some of that there. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they feel like they can't handle this right now. The or more, never could. That's why we're here. <laughs> the, the more we identify some of these groups, the more I'm thinking, I don't know what they think yet. I don't know. Mm -hmm. if, I wonder if that's a problem for us. But we don't know. Yeah, I mean that's a huge part of this. Ex these exercises. There's a few of them. Is is yeah, realizing what you do and don't know. Um, it, it illuminates that when you realize, uh oh, I don't know where to put them on this map. I don't know where they stand. And that's exactly why this is a powerful exercise because it forces you to do that work and try to understand where these players are so that you can you can you know act accordingly to to that. I was gonna um, I'm Michael here. I was gonna say something kind of like Palomi that the facilities depart, I like this visual. It really makes you have to think about who's involved and where they sit. Mm -hmm. But as opposed to the facility workers themselves, I was thinking more in terms of the facilities department of which there are two. There's the Boston mm -hmm. BPS facilities department, and then there's the Boston city facilities department, both mm -hmm. of which have a lot of influence. And both of which I really don't know where they stand, because sometimes they seem to be holding us back and sometimes they seem to be wanting to move forward. Yeah, but these yeah. facilities departments do have a lot of yeah. power in exactly how things are going to get played out in terms of fixing schools. And when you say the department, do you mean the you mean you said you meant more the leadership rather than or the administration rather than the union or the workers? Yes, yes. That, yeah. When I'm talking, that's what I'm talking about. I think there's yeah. a lot of factors, but that's how I think of it. Yeah. 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 I think someone else was trying to weigh in. I can't I can't see people. I can only hear. Yeah, um, this is Mike. 
this is an unusual campaign in that we don't face organized opposition uh, or like people defending their interests. What we face is inertia and a lot of silos, fragmentation of decision making and execution. Um, and that's that's what's up with these departments, and for that matter, the school committee, which you know this this stuff really isn't on their radar screen. They have a lot of other problems to deal with, um, but they're appointed by the mayor in Boston, so they're going to go along with whatever the mayor wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is a good segue. We don't have so much time, and so um, I think I'm going to move on unless anyone has any burning thoughts on this particular exercise before I move on. This is Tom. I, I just have a quick question. It, 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 it occurs to me that the, the health professionals are a really key part of, uh, of certainly the ventilation aspect of, of the campaign. But that, again, is a really huge swath of people. And uh, you know, I wonder how you go about planning in a timeline for um, I, sort of along with what Michael's saying, bringing people together, people that are know about asthma to talk with, I don't know, the school committee or the facilities workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, that's... it's a timing thing. I, it seems to me, in, in in addition to identifying the 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 most impactful health organizations. Yeah, yeah, and like I was saying before, it's like the health professionals maybe right now aren't super influential if they're not engaging on this, they're not talking. But if they get in front of these decision making bodies, suddenly they do become, you know, pretty influential. So, you know, the map kind of evolves as you organize and, and make things happen as a group. Um, I think I'm gonna move yeah. on just for time. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, That's yeah, all right. I'll, I'll just say very briefly, a lot of public health asthma people uh, are becoming more aware of the link between climate change and their work and some, uh, some housing and even schools, maybe I sent a, the link to a few of the, of the team on the school team. Um, our start, there's a model starting to appear of collaborations in different states. So that's all I'll say on that. That's great. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, you know, I think this is an exercise that you all can do. Um, we don't have a ton of time to stay with it tonight, but hopefully this is a good tool for you all. And again, it's identifying, it, it helps you understand, oh, there's all these groups, we don't really know where they stand. You know, let's figure that out so we can be more strategic with who we're working with and what we're doing. So hopefully this exercise can help illuminate that and, and be useful to you all. Because it's easy to just be doing the work and go, 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 but to step back and do these visual strategy sessions, I think is really valuable. Um, here's another one that I find really helpful. We kind of got into talking about this last time. Um, it sounds like you don't have any active opposition, or at least, you know, someone chimed in and said, no one's really organizing against this per se, which may be true. And so this, this wedge on the right of active opposition might be empty. You might have some passive opposition where people, they don't like the idea for one reason or another, but they're not doing anything about it. Um, you're talking about the schools, greening the schools, which campaign are you talking about? Yeah, I was speaking of, yeah, the schools, okay. yeah. And, you know, that may or may not be true. Maybe there are some small, you know, a few voices of active opposition, but the point of this exercise is to map out along this spectrum of, you know, you have yeah. your active allies, that's you all who are actively working to support this. You have folks who are passive allies, they support it, but they're not doing anything about it. Yeah. Um, plenty of folks are neutral, don't really care, um, Pat, or they have no opinion, or they just don't know about it at all. So they're neutral. Passive opposition, um, again, they don't probably love the idea, but they're not doing anything all the way to active opposition. And the benefit of this, again, understanding where people are at, but specifically thinking about different actions that you all do, especially public facing actions 
and how it influences each camp in this uh, um, in this wet or in this semicircle here, this spectrum of allies. So certain actions are going to move people in different directions. Some things that you do, it might move everyone to the left and and move shift everyone towards you know the next quad the next segment. But other actions you do might have different effects on different groups. Like if you did a more controversial action like blocking traffic or something, you might move some neutral people into passive allies because now they know about this and they're upset that the schools are you know, not safe and healthy and are environmentally bad. Now they know about it, so maybe now they're passive allies, but you also might shift some neutral folks into opposition if they got stuck in traffic or got angry. Yeah. Um, I hear someone trying to chime in. Please go ahead. Or maybe that was just background noise. No, uh, I was just going, uh-huh. <laughs> okay, yeah. Again, like I can't see, so feel free to interrupt um, if you want to say something. Yeah, but yeah. Um, this is a great graphic because it also speaks to kind of the, the organization building dimension of a campaign, which is that um, a key part of winning or a key part of winning is to build up the active allies set. You're tr yes, you're trying to move the whole spectrum toward you, but um, the more people you have that are enthusiastically with you and unified, the likely you are to win. And to get them, you want to, you kind of go pie slice by pie slice. You recruit active allies from passive allies. You take neutrals and turn them into passive allies. Um, you don't try to recruit people in the active opposition. You don't waste time cultivating them uh, because, you know, getting them into the active allies group is like a moonshot. Exactly. No, that's exactly it. You want to move people to that next wedge um, as much as possible. Or just understand where they are, and even if you're not going to move them. Other, I do think we have to keep rolling for time's sake, but any other thoughts or questions on this exercise? Okay, great. And again, we'll have some time at the end too, but hopefully that one can be helpful for you all as a tool. Um, one more that I'll show you, we won't really dive into this one, but it's another tool um, called Relationship Circles. It's another visual power mapping tool that you can use where you pick one specific decision maker that's important, um, an individual typically, not a group um, or a body, but an actual individual person. And you try to map out what influences them. This is super helpful, especially when you feel like you have no connection to someone and it, it seems impossible to influence them or move them, is to do, take stock of, okay, well, who do they listen to? What influences them? What do they care about? Um, and kind of map that out. And then maybe if you can't influence them, so like in this example, you see our team in pink over to the right. You maybe can't influence the superintendent, but maybe you can influence this religious leader who can influence a good friend of the superintendent and find find different ways to to have that influence. Um, oh, I see Linda had to jump jump off. I'm just catching up on the chat. Um, so yeah, this is um, this is another one that you all can use when you're trying to kind of crack the code of how do we influence a specific power player. All right. I talked a little bit with the weatherization campaign inside game outside game, but working internally, maybe you have an ally um, on the, you know, within the city council or whatever decision making body it may be, who can work internally or has a relationship can have those meetings directly with um, decision makers and work with them, coordinate with them to try to move something forward. Very different strategy and uh, sort of skill set and work than outside game, which is kind of building popular support and often even involves like public shaming of a decision maker. So 
you know, I think the two are very different from one another, but they're both important to work and they can work hand in hand if, if done strategically and done well. Um, so I'm not going to go super deep, but at the end, if people want to dive deeper into inside outside game, um, we can do that, but it's at least at the very least, it's important to be aware of the two and, and how they're interacting to, um, influence decision makers. All right. Now I think I'm going to pass it over to Phoebe, um, for a bit and, if folks, you know, I know we've been talking for a while, so if you want to stand up, stretch, you know, get a sip of water, um, definitely do that, because um, I know it's it can be hard to focus this long. But again, appreciate you all staying with us and going to pass it over to Phoebe. Thanks, Jack. Awesome. So getting more into these strategies for campaigning. Uh, Petitions are a really crucial part of any campaign. I'm sure you guys are super familiar with petitions, um, but aside from being this visual show of support for your issue, they're really helpful for the back end for the data as well. Um, you know, you're gathering some of this contact info that you can use for your email lists. And you're also, by gathering addresses or zip codes, you can show these decision makers that you know, their constituents care and that these signatories are not just a ragtag group of random people, but they're actually directly represented uh, by these decision makers as well and not some random outsiders. Awesome. And so uh, I'm not actually sure about this for BCAN, but have you guys utilized door-to-door -door canvassing for any of your campaigns in the past? If you want to just put in the chat or chime in. Anybody? When when would you when would you do this? When would you what would lead you to do that? Awesome. Yeah, I can I can get into that for sure. So it seems like maybe there isn't so much utilization of you can thus far. So excited to tell you guys a little bit about this strategy. Um, Jack and I are both seasoned door-to-door -door canvassers and um, you know, we really feel it's one of the most important tools in grassroots organizing. Um, you know, for one, you're going to reach so many different people with door-to-door -door canvassing. Um, you know, door-to-door -door canvassing can be utilized for a variety of different things to help out your campaign. Um, you know, kind of whether you're going to door to door for petition signatures, or maybe you're trying to turn folks out to an event, um, you know, just educate the community. Canvassing is a really crucial tool. And kind of no matter how much you're engaging with the community through your campaign, there's always going to be these people that you're not going to be able to interact with, except for the time that you're actually, you know, at their doorstep. I see some nods uh, from the videos over there. So, you know, certain people can't show up to every event for a variety of reasons, like take the single mom. She might not be able to make it out to one of your, you know, special events or to turn out to, um, you know, hand out flyers or table, but she probably will be able to open her door. And, you know, meeting people at their own doorstep is a really great way to kind of reduce some of these barriers of entry into your cause and into your organization um, by kind of just meeting people, uh, you know, at their own home and on their own time. Um, and you're really, you know, through canvassing, you're having these real conversations with real people who are affected by your campaign, um, you know, not only helping them get a better understanding, but helping your campaign kind of get all of the lived experiences and views on the issue. Cool. So um, I know we talked a little bit about, you know, roles in, in volunteering um, and potentially a good way to incorporate a role for a volunteer would be to have someone that is specifically training the people that you're sending out door to door. Um, but even in an instance where you're not able to have someone do that, there are some really great strategies uh, that you can utilize to get canvassers out and have them feeling comfortable. Um, you know, canvassing can be nerve wracking. You're literally knocking on a random person's door. Um, and so you really want to make sure that your canvassers are as comfortable as possible and equipped with all of the knowledge, um, you know, about the campaign material and 
possible Canvas <laughs> interactions um, before venturing forth. So kind of a really good way to get that rolling is to have your canvassers practice with a partner. Um, you know, if there are some BCAN volunteers that have experience in canvassing from another walk of life, um, really awesome to pair someone that is experienced with someone that is uh, a novice at canvassing. Um, these interactions, you can go back and forth. You can address common um, responses to kind of your script that you'll have laid out and, um, you know, both positive and negative and just prepare your canvassers for anything that they might encounter or try your best to. Um, it's also really helpful to send new canvassers with seasoned canvassers whenever possible. Um, you know, for their first few or for first times, um, really they're able to get constructive feedback right in the moment. And they're also able to have their questions answered in real time. Motivation of your canvassers is also super, super important. Um, so this here is a photo of um, the organization that Jack and I both worked for, VPIRG, and we would have these big group meetings before we all dispersed to the various uh, areas that we were canvassing in. And, um, you know, when we were announcing kind of where people were going for the day, there'd be these crew calls and we would, you know, do them in a rap format or a poetry format or, you know, to a song. And they were always really, really great at motivating us to go out and, and do this work. Um, so really important to just remind your canvassers why they're here, what they're fighting for, um, you know, hype them up, get them excited and send them on their way. Uh, and then, you know, on the back end, a little more boring, but be sure to keep good data both at the door and when you get home, um, you know, be sure to gather that name, number, email, um, address if relevant, so that in the future you can utilize that as well. Cool. So now you're at someone's door what happens. Um, the first thing to remember, you know, after introducing yourself, say, hi, I'm Phoebe, and I'm here with BCAN to talk with you about housing justice. You want to be sure to find some common ground with the person. Um, it's a really great way to start kind of any Canvas interaction. Um, you know, say like, oh my gosh, your garden looks so beautiful, or is that your German Shepherd? What's his name? I have a German Shepherd. His name is Bernie. Really just make them comfortable, like right out of the bat. Um, you're kind of, you're doing a good thing and odds are there's something that you're going to agree with this person on. You also want to match the energy of the person at the door. Um, so if they're really subdued and quiet, you want to be calm and reserved. But if they're super excited because they love BCAN and they've seen everything that you guys have done so far and they just love you so much, you want to match that energy and be super excited with them. Um, only time that you do not want to match energy of someone at the door is if they're being hostile towards you. It's not a majority of Canvas interactions, but it will occur. Um, you know, it, it's okay to engage in some constructive conversation if you feel that it's appropriate, but don't be ar argumentative with anybody. Um, if someone becomes hostile, just say thank you for your time and be on your way. Um, it's, it's not worth it for your campaign, and it's typically just not something that you want to engage in with someone, especially at their door. You also on that kind of want to meet people where they're at. You know, if someone isn't fully agreeing with you, that's okay. Maybe by having this conversation, you're going to move them a little bit closer to where you want them to be. Like Jack was talking about before, move them a little bit to the left. Uh, and maybe the next time that you interact with them, you'll move them even more. And then lastly, you just want to be persistent. So they're busy. You can be quick. They can't really talk right now. That's OK. I can come back at 6. Does that work for you? And then you want to just make the ask. And what does that mean for BCAN? That can mean kind of, can you sign my petition? Will you email the city to demand that Boston Public Schools, at a minimum, have a modern HVAC? If they say no to your ask, go back to the conversation find some more common ground, and then make your ask again if you can. Okay, so switching gears a little bit here and gonna talk about socials for BCAN and some general tips. So BCAN really has a great social media. Um, you know, it's engaging, it's cohesive. 
Um, there's kind of a great utilization of graphic design and you guys have a lot of followers, um, <clears throat> pardon me, but just hoping to kind of give you guys some universal and, and specific feedback on that area as well. Um, so when it comes to socials, one of the most important things is just being active and being consistent. So I see this lovely post of Hassan here and his rise to power. Uh, but as we were making this slideshow <laughs> and the last we checked, um, this was the last thing that you guys had posted on Instagram um, in January. So as much as you can be posting even small victories, small things, it's going to be really helpful for socials. So even these meetings, like, you know, every other Thursday saying like, hey, just a reminder, we're meeting tonight at 6 p.m. Here's the link. All super helpful. Um, sharing kind of like small victories. We don't always have to post like we won the whole campaign. We can say like, oh, hey, we got support from this person on this issue. And this is why that's important. Um, on that line, you know, posting the action steps that people can take. This is something that you guys are really, really great at. Um, I see you have this whole action alert series. And that is super important to keep people engaged in your socials. And, you know, especially for the young generation, you know, we, we love to be activists, but a lot of that activism sadly does take place online. Um, brings us kind of to that strategic posting, you know, petition signatures, you can get so many more petition signatures in, in a lot less time <laughs> by posting um, on social media and asking your followers to um, sign, you know, petitions or to show up for an event or, you know, kind of anything like that using you know social media is a really great tool to turn out for these types of things um you know engagement in general your members should be hyping up all of your posts um you know many people are enticed into orgs because it seems like a great community or really active group uh, and by not posting so frequently you wonder are we are we an active group um so that would be kind of one thing as well as you know every time that you have the opportunity to tell your members like hey we are going live today. Will you, you know, share that? Or if you have a post about an event, say like, hey, can you guys send this to three people on your, you know, in your DMs and ask them if they can come out. Um, just utilizing the audience that you already have to have a greater impact. Cool. So strategic sharing as well is super important in growing your audience. So being sure to work the algorithm algorithms that already exist. Um, one example of that is time of day. Facebook and Instagram on the back end will tell you when your followers are most active. Uh, so for us, it's like 7 p.m. Whatever it is for you, it'll tell you that. And you can try to kind of play, uh, play with kind of when you posted and how much interaction that got and see kind of what's going to be best for your organization. Similar with you know, if you have pictures of people and those are doing so much better than just the graphic designs that you've created, you know, just taking a step back to really look at everything that you've um, created so far and the impact and engagement that it's having. Another way to kind of grow your following is to interact with similar groups. So tagging larger accounts or accounts with more following whenever you can, using hashtags. So, you know, I'm sure there's a ton of campaign specific hashtags that you guys could be utilizing um, housing justice, safe schools, et cetera. Um, to the left here is just some of the, according to Google, most popular um, climate-oriented hashtags. Um, but hashtags and tagging people are really important because they'll allow you to uh, show up on the suggested feed or on you know feeds of people that um, aren't already following you and aren't kind of attuned to what you're doing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about tracking analytics as well on the next slide. So this is a tool that we use. This is called Metricool. Tons of tools out there. We just came across this one. It's free. But there's a lot out there that do the same exact thing. Um, any tool like this online that will show you all of your socials in one place is going to be super helpful if you have multiple accounts going at the same time. So these analytics are just an example of our TikTok account that we are trying to grow. And so here you can see, you know, we got some posts out March 3rd, 7th, 9th. They didn't do that great in terms of, you know, the interactions that we got from them, the likes, 
the followers that we accrued after posting them. Then on the 17th, we got a post and that got a ton of interaction and gave us some followers, et cetera. So really being able to see visually what's going on with your socials and who is following you or unfollowing you <laughs> and reacting to uh, specific posts and specific outreach is really helpful um, in, in trying to improve and grow your social media presence. last thing you'll hear from me and similar communications email lists. Like we talked about petitions, they can help you build out these lists. I hear that you already have a big one going and you uh, promoted this event in that and that's awesome. That's a really great way to engage. Um, you know, just keep these emails to once a week, sometimes two. You don't want to bug people by emailing them too often, but you don't want to go ghost and not talk to them at all. So finding that balance and what that means for your organization is super important. Keep them short as possible, bite-sized and digestible. If you send a policy memo to someone essentially in an email, they're not gonna read that. Um, you want it to be kind of littered with fun colors and memes, some clickbaity subject lines, really draw in the attention and have it be something that they wanna read throughout. Um, another tool that you may be able to utilize is any time that you are in contact with another organization or celebrity or just public figure in Boston, if you would, if they would be willing to send out something in your name or you know have give you a quote about how they support you, that's really really helpful for engaging you know, both your socials and your email lists as well. Um, not sure how many of you are on our email list, but. Slight plug, <laughs> I'd love to add you all to it after this. Um, and we did have an email go out today from Jane Fonda and the Jane Fonda Climate Act uh, Pack. And that was one of our most successful emails to date. So these are really super helpful tools. Um, and it's kind of switching up who's sending your emails and texts and having it whenever you can be from a prominent figure. I'll pass it back to Jack, who is muted. <laughs> All right, can folks hear me? Sorry, I started talking, but was on mute. Um, thanks a lot, Phoebe. So we're winding down to the final part of our of our presentation. Thanks everyone for again bearing with us, and we'll go to Q and A pretty soon. Want to talk a little bit about traditional media as well. It is still relevant. Not everything social media you want to work. Um, you know, traditional news outlets as well. This was from just the other day, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this story. Um, but this is, uh, I, I forget the exact name, but it's one, it's one of the big news outlets in Boston that, that covered this action from two days ago. Um, and I think covered it in a way that was really favorable, actually, to, to the group. So we'll talk a little bit about this. You want to think a lot about framing and how you can frame your work in the media and ensure that it's it's going to be portrayed in a positive light to win over additional allies again thinking about that spectrum of allies and how how you can move them a lot of it is just talking about it strategizing as a group and ideally designating you know one or a few people to to really focus in on media and be the spokesperson for the campaign when you're planning an action especially if you can direct you know, the attendees to send media to the media spokesperson, that's a really great way to control the narrative. Because if you have an action and someone shows up who it's their first action with you all, and a TV reporter sticks a microphone in their face, they might not represent the campaign the way you wanted, you would want it to be represented to, you know, 100,000 viewers on the nightly news. And so the more that you can control that and control the framing, it's critical. Part of that is just cultivating and developing relationships with, with local media, which again, you all may have already done this, but I think um, having as many folks who are involved being aware of this. Um, media alerts or media advisories, it's, it's really good to send these out before you host an event, especially a big one, and, and send these out to um, ideally all the, the media outlets that cover, um, that cover Boston. Get this in front of them leading up to an event that's really going to increase the chance that they're going to attend and you want to entice them 
You want to give them the quick bullet points of what this action is, why it's newsworthy, why you should attend. I know here in Vermont, it's probably a little different in Vermont in Boston, but we live in a 24 hour news cycle. J journalists, local journalists are constantly hunting for stories and in many cases are, are really desperate for content and stories. And so you might be surprised that even smaller actions and things you're doing can actually get media coverage um, as long as you get it in front of reporters and make their job as easy as possible. They're trying to crank out stories constantly. And if you make it easy for them to do that, you know, it's a win-win situation for you and them. So these media alerts and then press releases for sure as well. This, this news story from a couple of days ago about the bank action, I think came out of a good press release. That's my theory. A good press release is basically you write the story that you want to see and you send it to all the local media. And again, they're trying to get these stories out quick. So if you already wrote it for them and it's, it's decent and it you know, is factual, they might use a lot of it. And I think that might have happened um, on Thursday. And I've definitely had it happen where, uh, you know, where the journalist barely even edits a press release that I send them and they just, they just post it basically as is. And that's the ideal. This story um, from Thursday, it was, it was a very positive light. The quotes were really compelling and strong. The group seemed, you know, serious, seemed like they knew what they were doing. The campaign was explained well, and there was no counterpoint. There was no, like, there was nothing in the story that detracted from the campaign or opposed it. And it, it was a pretty ideal story. So you can make this happen by getting ahead of it and kind of writing the story for them and getting out. It would be great if you could remember what that media outlet was, because I haven't found any coverage of it, that particular event. Locally. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that for you. WBUR. I'll okay. put the link in the chat. It was WBUR, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks for doing that. Um, yeah, if you read the story, again, my theory <laughs> is that that maybe came from a press release from some of the organizers, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, move, moving away from media, um, talk a little bit about recruitment. I know this was an area that you all wanted to focus in on. Um, so we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit, recruitment and retention. Um, there's obviously some of these mass outreach strategies to make folks aware of what you're doing, whether that's canvassing or cold, you know, cold calling, phone banking, social media being another key one, postering and flyering around the community um tabling at key events like a classic spot to table for environmentally related orgs would be at farmers markets um but or outside you know outside of a grocery store something like that um just getting in front of people getting out there through all the channels that you can um and ideally with recruiting you you know if you're trying to recruit a diverse set of people into your cause it's important that the people doing the recruitment represent a diversity of, of identities. Um, yeah. That way it's easier to pull in folks of differing identities so that they feel like, you know, there's a place for them in this movement and in this campaign. If, if they're only seeing one demographic and it's very different from their demographic, they might not feel like this is the campaign for them. So utilizing, you know, the existing diversity of identities that you have in your group and representing that as you do your recruitment and outreach, I think is is critical. And this can be done both in person recruitment and social media recruitment as well. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, there's different challenges to recruitment. Um, people are stressed, people are busy, and a lot of people have various forms of of social anxiety and, and might be nervous to, to join into a new group um, or people are just in their in their routines. Um, so making folks feel welcome and, and bringing them in. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. You can recruit someone versus, it, you know, you can recruit folks through social media and get them to show up to an action or a meeting. But what's going to get them to actually stay and continue to be involved more than just once? That's going to really come down to the in-person, making folks feel welcome, feel a part of the group, connected 
to other members and in that community. So we're gonna get into that a little bit um, before we wrap up and go to Q&A. You know, you can recruit your friends too. That's the thing. I think some people are scared to, people kind of keep it separate between, um, you know, between their friends and their social life and then their activism organizing volunteer work. But in reality, you know, you can definitely recruit your friends to get involved in the organizing work you're doing and bringing that relationship into the space can actually help build community and you can hold each other accountable. And um, I think it can be really beneficial. Also just networking and attending other groups, um, showing up for them and, and maybe getting involved in what they're doing, but also kind of representing BCAN as you do that. You show up at other groups and say like, yeah, I'm involved with BCAN, wanted to see what you all are doing, how we can support and collaborate, um, I think is another way to cross pollinate and bring folks into your work. Uh, we already talked about some of these other uh, methods of recruitment. Okay, this is for recruitment intent and retention. To me, this is the most important thing. So um, if you're dozing off, maybe this is a moment to, to tune in because if you don't know about the ladder of engagement, to me, it's one of the most powerful organizing tools that there is. This is moving people up in their involvement as high as they will go. So the lowest letter of that ladder is maybe someone who sees your petition online or you show up at their door and they sign the petition, um, they do a really easy sort of one-off quick action, like a petition. That's that lowest letter, level of engagement. The next level is maybe they attend an actual event or an action that you all put on. You know, maybe they saw your petition, they signed it, and then you emailed them and said, hey, come out to this, or you phone bank them and said, hey, we have a big action, come out, and they showed up. But, you know, without cultivation and without awareness of this ladder, you know, they may show up to that event, they may enjoy it, and then may not do anything else until the next big event or drop out. But if you're, if you're conscious of this and you make the connection with people and move them up the ladder, you can get that person to attend a meeting. When someone attends a meeting, really important to do some one-on-one -on -one follow up. Um, for the folks that are already involved, make that personal connection with them, show that they're welcome, they're here, you notice them, you see them, you want to get them involved. You can offer to even meet with someone one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's really powerful. Forging that connection and relationship, bringing them into the work. And if people are still excited at that point, continue to elevate their leadership and say, hey, you want to actually you know, help us plan the next meeting or help us, you know, with strategy and what's going on and bring them into that core organizing team. So it's critical to be aware of, like, I'll never forget, you know, I was a first year in college and I went to this group called Student Climate Culture, attended one of their meetings because I had heard about them. At the end of the meeting, I'm walking out the door, you know, I didn't really know anyone. And one of the organizers who had been leading the meeting, like grabs me and says, hey, what's what's your story? You know, nice to meet you. Like, why'd you come to this? Um, yeah, great. Do you want to trade phone numbers? You want to get coffee and talk more about what we're doing? And I said, sure. And, you know, we followed up, we met, we talked and he said, Hey, why don't you help us figure out our next meeting? Help us, you know, organize and facilitate and just brought me right into that leadership team. I ended up putting in, you know, tons of hours a week as part of this group where I would have just if he didn't intervene, I would have just walked away and, you know, maybe come back or not type thing. So by cultivating this ladder and continuing to move people up in it as high as they will go, it's a critical way to retain people and, and build. But not everyone's going to just climb that ladder. Like people have capacity limits. Um, so finding where they land and where they fall and make sure they can be involved, even if it's even if they are just gonna show up, you know, to a few events a year, that's fine, but just making them feel welcome and so that they actually do that. And maybe someone doesn't want to canvas, they don't want to do in person, but maybe they're great at social media. And if you can give them a role that fits what they want to do, um, they're more likely to, you know, stay involved. Um, and so trying to figure out what someone would be excited about and, and pair them up with that, I think is key um, for retention. 
Um, mentorship is key too. I kind of already alluded to that. It's not only beneficial for the the mentee um, who you're bringing into more leadership, but the, the mentor as well is benefiting a lot from taking someone under their wing, explaining the campaign, cultivating that leadership. I always live by the idea that, you know, leadership is about creating more leaders and organizing is about creating more organizers. So mentorship is, is key to that. Yeah, rec you know, and it's important to recognize, like, you don't want to push people too far when we talk about the ladder engagement. You want to track kind of where they're at. If someone's showing an eagerness, a willingness to do more and excitement, that's when you really want to move them up that ladder, get them more involved. But obviously, if someone's not really and they seem kind of tapped out, um, recognize that and find ways to meet them where they're at and make sure they know that they can still be a part of this. They don't have to put in a bunch of hours each week they can show up in the way that they want to show up and making making that work for everyone but when you do see that gleam in someone's eyes and they're clearly you know their interest is peaked that's when you really want to give them more to do give them ways to get more involved and to help lead rather than just saying oh yeah you know we'll see you next time saying like oh actually you know do you want to get more deeply involved in this and, and pulling them into that Um, I'm going to pass it in a moment um, off to Nicole. My last thing I wanted to just touch on was was burnout. And again, this this has to do with making sure folks are not overburdening themselves. I, I, I know we're running short on time. A lot of what I'll just say on this is to talk about it. That's the biggest thing, to actually create some time and space to talk about where folks are at, how they're feeling. Are people overwhelmed and are overburdened or are they feeling energized and ready to do more and recognizing like and being able to say, hey, I, I've taken on too much. Like, I can't do this right now. Can someone step up? And it's all around checking in with one another, checking in with yourself, being open and honest about where you're at, because if you don't and someone gets into a situation where they're overworking and they burn out, they're then going to disengage and it can be really um, harmful to them and to the group. So the awareness is the key thing here, but if we have time, we can talk more about strategies. Um, and now I'll pass to Nicole to, to kind of finish this out before we open it up. Yeah. So like Jack mentioned before, um, as, as you know, um, campaigns can be really stressful. So uh, maintaining a fun, warm environment, um, is really essential to tackling burnout. Um, it's also a great retention tool for new volunteers and team members, um, and, main, and it helps maintain enthusiasm um, along the campaign trail. Um, it could also be, um, a, like I said, a key factor for recruitment. Um, it's human nature for us to want to feel like a sense of belonging um, and a shared mission with our coworkers. Um, and forging genuine relationships is crucial um, for in the enduring for enduring the lifelong journey that is climate policy activism. Um, so some uh, community building best practices include like creating space during your regular planning meetings. I think you have every other Thursday meetings, um, creating a little bit of space inside those meetings to do a little bit of a personal check in, uh, maybe have a little bit of fun. Um, hosting meetings and events in roomy locations and opening them up to the broader community is a great strategy to boost enthusiasm around your campaign um, and get the word out to the community using social media um, and depending on the capacity of your space, of course, um, have team members invite potential volunteers or new team members. Um, that's like we talked about with networking, family, friends, coworkers, et cetera. Um, and meeting outside the formal campaign setting from time to time is a great way to boost morale. Um, so depending on the lifestyles, ages, and other aspects of the team members, um, some fun ways to build community include like house parties, game nights, potlucks, and barbecues, um, in outside activities like sledding and river tubing, um, award season watch parties, <laughs> um, trash pickup walks. Um, would be great in the Boston downtown. Um, another thing is like if you have creatives on your team, um, do some live streaming or, or accessible concerts. 
um, or art shows that you can either do that just for fun or you could even use that as a fundraising strategy. Um, and lastly, we're gonna look a little bit at monitoring engagement. Um, so like Phoebe showed you earlier with the social media metrics, um, analyzing other types of data can show you how well your message is re reaching your community and like how engaged your supporters and volunteers are. Um, it's really important to measure this engagement because um, insights always improve outcomes and improvements are usually directly proportional to the time and care taken while you gather your data. Um, meaningful insights will help your organization make smart resource investments, um, achieve your mission, and become just a little bit better at saving the world. Um, measurement really helps tell your story. So measuring engagement and impact and then reporting it back to the public can help tell the story of your organization's journey and its successes. Measurement improves volunteer relations by helping um, you understand how the community perceives your organization, what they do with the information that you send out to them, and how to best direct your efforts. Measurement also helps you exceed expectations. Um, important metrics like the number of trees planted or number of petition signatures, um, or even just like minds opened um, can be quantified in a way that shows the value and impact of the work on, that you do on the community. Some tools that you can use to monitor this engagement um, are things like spreadsheets, uh, like Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel, if you have people that um, have experience with those. Um, online surveys like Google Forms or Facebook and Instagram both have polls now that you can send out. Um, apps like Event Check-In or Constant Contact that encourage community members to, and volunteers to check in at certain locations or your events. Um, text responses, uh, specifically for like the younger demographic that are more text friendly. Um, this is a great tool for reaching community members or volunteers immediately and monitoring their engagement. Um, remember, just keep calm and document. Um, capture lessons learned big or small. Um, use a collaborative platform like Google Docs that members can and volunteers can access um, and add to in their own free time. Um, and then ask team members and volunteers to reflect upon their experiences and lessons learned that speak to the best practices and things that you, they could do differently the next time and review your document as a team and summarize it into do's, potential improvements, and do, don't do's. Um, and then remember, it's okay to fail forward. Ask members and volunteers to share their failures, take a bow, and move on. Um, removing the stigma of failure encourages people to be more imaginative, to take risks, and try new things. Um, my favorite example of this is the grassroots organization Moms Rising, who hold what they call joyful funerals, um, where they give unsuccessful initiatives, formal burials and eulogies, um, and then use that time to brainstorm new ideas um, to improve future campaigns. All right. That was a lot. Um... Thanks everyone for hanging with us. I know we covered a lot of ground. Um, I think now we'd love to hear from you all and kind of open up a conversation with the remaining time. Um, so if anyone wants to, you know, chime in or raise your hand or go in the chat and while you well, have it. I'll it. just chime in real quickly. This is Terry. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you can't see my face. Uh, that was wonderful. And, and it was really helpful. Uh, I, in particular, I think, you know, this latter part, but a lot of the rest of it too, about how to how to engage people and keep them engaged is something that we always are struggling with, but that's really, really helpful. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that right off. That was very, very useful. Great, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, and we do, speaking of the whole monitoring engagement piece and feedback, we do have, um, feedback forms too. So we'll, we'll post a link um, in the chat so that people can give any feedback on the training. Amazing, yeah, likewise, this was super, super helpful, especially since we have like basically all of our core volunteer leaders here. So um, this was great. And then I was curious, Jack, especially given your experience as a city councilor, do you feel like 
elected officials are responsive when uh, someone brings the petition to them with X number of signatures? And like, does the number of signatures affect how they would receive it? Yeah, so, and Phoebe can speak to this too, I think. But yeah, from the elected official side, I mean, the main the main benefit of petitions in my mind is actually the data gathering and the ability to have names and phone numbers that you can then email, call, follow up and engage. I think that's the most important thing. But to Phoebe's point, like if an elected official sees, oh, a hundred of my constituents sign this, that is really powerful and meaningful. So it kind of depends more on who's signing it versus how many. Because we had, like when I was city council, we would get sort of these mass um, form emails where someone could do the whole like one click email your council thing. And some of them we would get, you know, hundreds of people, but they weren't living in Burlington. So it was kind of that only meant so much. But when someone would put their name and address at the bottom and you're like, oh, the, you know, that's my constituent, that's my constituent, then it starts to really create some pressure. Right. I think also you can get creative in that delivery of the petition as well. Like that photo that we showcased, they blew it up to, you know, kind of like those joke checks that they give on game shows, you know, just really blow it up, really make it kind of in their face. I know Jack talked about being involved in the fossil fuel divestment at UVM. And uh, for one of my classes, actually, it was, it was like social activism and climate change. Um, we like yeah. wrapped this package and delivered it to the dean that was, you know, petitions that we gathered all throughout Canvas asking to divest. So, um, you know, any way that you can kind of make it this like show of support, it's going to be really beneficial. Right. Yeah, I mean, and Mike's totally right. I mean, a petition is one thing, but actually, you know, a constituent from an elected official side, like someone coming to you face to face with a phone call or a meeting and really urging you to do something is is much more powerful. Um, but not everyone's going to be willing to do that and they will maybe sign a petition. So it's different tools for different folks. Yeah, and sometimes numbers do count. I mean, I remember two or three summers ago, this isn't exactly the same thing, but you know, the 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 state announced suddenly overnight that they were going to forbid open water swimming in all the places around the Boston area because of drownings and so on. And boy, they had a petition of five thousand names before the weekend was over. You know, uh, so it did make a difference in that case. Totally, yeah. It shows you that scale of opposition yeah. um, that can really, because you don't, a lot of times as an elected, you don't really know where people are at on something. Mm -hmm. A lot of issues that you're voting on, you have no idea where the public's at, um, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. local elected official. So a big petition is gives you that knowledge of, oh, people, they care, they're paying attention, and they they do or don't like this um, is is pretty key. I have another question, but I don't want to hog the mic here. <laughs> so if someone else wants to ask one. I think you're good. I saw Bobby, if you were trying to get in, I saw you come off mute. Um, but if not, you could probably go, um, Terry. Um, yeah, I don't think I have much to add other than what I feel like has already been said. But um, I think the engagement piece was huge because like uh, I think it was Terry that said, you know, we're always struggling. How do we keep people engaged with um a campaign and like um I'm managing a lot of um the social media lately and like I did was actually checking on my phone like um you know how active is our social media um and I think like you know I think in terms of just like reposting stuff um there's definitely more ways to get creative with it and you know keep engagement with people even if it's anything small or big um you know make it look like it's a active ongoing campaign by just you know really communicating out those action steps or like whatever smaller or large action your group is partaking in and you know um you know i think it's a way of reaching a larger audience especially if you can get creative and supporting also your allies through social media i think that's been a key role mm -hmm. a lot of our social media as of late um 
But yeah, uh, I thought that was that part of it was particularly helpful, especially for me. So I thought it was good. That's great. Yeah, social media is huge, whether you love it or hate it, and I kind of hate it, but you can't <laughs> deny that it's extremely yeah. important. And if you're trying to make change, you're trying to reach people, you cannot ignore good social media. It's it's so critical. Mr. Um, Mike, you can go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to quickly say, you know, I'm I'm 24 and um, my interns still help me immensely with like figuring out what's on trend and what's going to hit uh, on social and, and really make an impact there. So as much as you can use your youth volunteers and I'm talking like high school, if you got them uh, to really help you with your socials, it's going to make a great impact there as well. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, well, you know, that's a bit of a segue into to my interest was uh, in your talk about data gathering and tracking uh, your impact and where your messages are getting picked up and stuff that I don't know. This is not my realm of work in the <laughs> in anything and certainly not at BCAN, but I'm curious what the others in BCAN who do that would say is do, what is our capacity in that regard? And is there something that that uh, these guys have presented tonight that we aren't doing that we maybe should do more of on that front? You know what I'm saying? Tracking our effects. Oh yeah, totally. No, this is that's a huge, huge like thing. And I think on the social media side and on the website traffic side, like we are tracking that, and that's fairly easy to track because there are like really concrete numbers around that. Um, where I think that we need to improve in our tracking, and I'd be curious if Run on Climate, if you have any suggestions about this, is just tracking how people are progressing up the ladder of engagement. Um, I don't have a great solution as far as like measuring that at, at a, you know, at scale. And um, that's somewhere where we definitely should do more. But how? Yeah, suggestions are appreciated yeah. from every, everyone. Well, I'll let other Beacon folks chime in, but yeah, I'm happy to chime in too. Hopeful. No, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, the ladder of engagement, yeah, the monitoring and stuff, and, and that's what a lot of what we talked about. Um, in your data, I don't know what how you all are doing data, but even just Google Sheets as a data thing, if you if you don't have an actual data program or software, it can be powerful. And ideally, you're measuring um, how someone came into your system. Like, did they get in through a, an online petition, or did you canvas them at their door, or did they sign up at an event or tabling? And just trying to notate. Um, if it was an in-person interaction, trying to actually notate what that was like and their level of enthusiasm. So a lot of it does have to do with the data that you keep um, and how you're recording people's engagement. And even, you know, meetings like this, just paying attention to who's who's attending and kind of having a sense of of that. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but data data is a key component of knowing your audience and where folks are at on that ladder of engagement. We've also talked about um, sort of responsibility responsibilities that go with um, levels of engagement um, to somehow be able to track that people who uh, are doing people who just come to events that we know that they've come um, people who volunteer to do leaflets that we know that they've done that it, it, it there's a, accountability I, I we we talked about at one point in, in terms of engaging people yeah no that's key because then if you're going to do a phone bank or something to turn people out to your next big action and you want you're trying to drive turnout maybe you do a, do some phone calling through your data list you would want to start with people who've attended past actions so if you have that data, you know, these are the people who've been to two or more actions of ours. Let's start by calling them because they're the most likely to say yes. And maybe once they say yes, we can even rope them into making calls with us and doing more turnout. Um, so, yeah, it does. You know, data is uh, 
it helps you be a lot more effective in your efforts because you can target and you can um, recruit better when you know those when you know those audiences and can kind of segment those audiences out. But how do you do that? For example, do you, is there a particular program? I mean, what is how can you track what everybody is doing? How, who show? I mean, do you just do it with a pen and pencil, a pencil and paper? I mean, how do you yeah, do that? There's different tools. I mean, if you have an actual database, um, then you can kind of, you can automate to some extent. With canvassing, like there are, there are automated canvassing tools yeah. where, and phone banking as well, um, like every action being an example of a popular one where each interaction you're, you're inputting directly in and then it's, it's logging that and it knows each constituent and it so when you then phone bank them it'll show you this constituent attended that event or did this or did that mm. when you're calling them you can see that so that's mm. that's if you have a tool like every action um or like van where you it, but it's a different type of canvassing if you yeah. do that because then you're going to canvas with tablets or phones right. to put that in if you do pen and paper, you do have to manually have someone enter it. And I think that goes to the roles thing is like some people don't want to do any face to face stuff, but they yeah. might want to crunch data and do numbers. So again, like finding volunteers that are that are interested in just inputting data from handwritten canvassing um, or diving into Google Sheets, organizing your data or or helping you all use a data program if you don't already have one. Have, have you tried to make a, a kind of a checklist of, of uh, sort of common tasks that are part of a campaign? Um, it's sort of like, uh, obviously getting signatures on a campaign, on a petition, um, you, you can see how, how a person has done uh, on a certain afternoon by the number of petitions, that uh, number of signatures that they got. Um, or if you're doing phone banking, that there's a, 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 some way of reporting, well, I, I spoke with six people and two people were interested so sort of, sort of um, responsibilities at different levels of of um, engagement. I think that makes sense. I'm not sure exactly what the if what the question was, I guess, but um, the, what you're sorry. saying makes sense to me for sure. I, I'm just I, I'm just wondering if, if there's a, a a kind of a data driven. Um, information gathering that you can do about the various roles um, that that people can play a, as members of a campaign from from very uh, uh, sort of relatively disengaged to very very engaged. Yeah, I mean, I guess what, I'm curious what you all use, like for example, for your petition. Um, does that backfill into, can anyone speak to your existing, I guess, systems for data? Yeah, right now we're using Action Network. And so the petitions and action alerts are backfilling into the uh, the main database. What I think we need to do better at though is um, capturing event signups and tagging those to uh, backfill as well. Yeah, so there's different automated systems, Tom, like, um, yeah, like Action Network or, you all had a sign up for this Zoom call. That's an example where you forced anyone who was trying to attend the Zoom call, I think you forced them to kind of register and sign up. That way it captures automatically. You don't have to manually look through these 18 people and write them down. Everyone's captured as having attended this meeting, having signed up. So y'all are definitely doing some of it. And you. I think it's just looking at that, analyzing it and trying to bring it together, especially when you're getting ready to do phone banking or something. Um, and ideally, I don't know if 
what level of action network you have but ideally you're doing the phone banking in that same program so that like i said when the person comes up and you're going to call them it'll tell you oh they signed this petition in february it'll give you that information or they opened your email last week or whatever it may be we use it we our main data system is called bloomerang um, that we use and so anyone who's donated or has opened an email or something like that, um, it, it kind of logs all that to that constituent and you can pull lists of, you know, give me a list of everyone who's donated in the last six months or everyone who's opened an email in the last two months. Like it'll, it'll pull those types of lists for us. But if you don't go that route, the more manual route, I think is just like Google Sheets and it takes a little more work, but you can still use Google Sheets to, sort by a column and see what people have done and stuff like that. And, and a second question, are, are, are the, the three of you all full-time employed? Are you paid for your work? Are you all volunteers at a climate run, uh, run on climate? Yeah, Phoebe and I, this is our, this is our prime, you know, this is our main work. This is basically our full-time work and we're paid. And then we have, um, Nicole is one of several student interns that are doing it for either course credit or otherwise. Um, and then we have volunteers as well that, in, that engage in our work. And, and do you feel like for the work that you're trying to do that two full-time people is adequate to keep moving forward we want to grow for sure um we're a new organization you know we've been around for about a year and we are we think that there's a lot more impact that we can have because again there's not that much support for local level climate activists and elected officials and organizers so the need is there and we want to help fill that need but we need to raise the funds to be able to grow and expand. Um, so, and, and, you know, we want to deliver this work for free to folks. So I guess I'll, I'll reiterate that, you know, any contributions are appreciated, um, but they're not in any way required. Like this is the work we want to do. And we, we fund that through accepting contributions. So um, if anyone's able and is interested in, you know, supporting our work, please do contribute. But um there's no pressure to it at all where we just want to continue, you know, doing this work and supporting folks that are doing the work like yourselves. Well, keep on, keep on, keeping on then. You're doing great work. Likewise, likewise, we're happy to be able to support the work that you all are doing. And we're going to be, you know, please be in touch with us. We want to, it's not just a one-off thing. Like we want to be a resource to you all ongoing um, right. in your efforts. And mm -hmm. if there's local elected officials in Boston who you think, you know, would, would like, to, would benefit from having free support for us on the policy side, that's mm -hmm. a lot of our work is supporting local electeds. We have a city councilor in Cambridge, Mass, um, Quinton Zondervan, who we work mm -hmm. a lot with over there but we don't have anyone any we don't have any boston elected officials in our network yet and so um you know if you know of any and you want to connect us that's great but either way like we're a resource for you all as you do this work super amazing yeah no thank you again um i think in terms of our next step we'll definitely be putting these uh practices in things that you've taught us into place in all of our campaigns. And then we will definitely reach out again as far as like once we figure out what are the gaps and things that we want more clarity on. And uh, so we'll talk again. And um, so I think we're good to wrap up unless anyone else has any other questions or comments. I no, wanna okay. Thank, I wanna thank everyone for the work y'all are doing and it's pretty awesome that you have, you know, 18 people that would come out on a Thursday and spend two hours focusing on this work and trying to improve and learn. That's really powerful. Um, I'm excited to see what 
you all can continue to accomplish and we're excited to support that and just know that it what you're doing it obviously matters a ton in Boston but it also matters more broadly and you know we're here to speak to that and um, we want to help amplify the impact of your work too so keep us in the loop on what you're doing we're happy to promote what you all are doing on our social media and just be an ongoing resource for you all in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you soon. Thank you.